Hello and welcome to Radio Free. Kevin Smith here, and I've got another great interview from the Radio Free podcast series. Now, if you listen to Radio Free on a regular basis, you know that we play a fairly wide variety of music here in our station. We're always searching for cool, different, off the beaten path kind of music to bring to our listeners. Well, during one of our searches, we came across a man by the name of Micah Borne. He's a rapper, a spoken word artist, who fell in love with the blues and then made a truly great record called No Ugly Babies. He was kind enough to call in and have a chat with me. Check it out. It's Micah Borne right here on Radio Free. everybody and welcome Kevin here to bring you yet another great radio free interview. Well actually I don't know if great is going to be a strong enough descriptor for what I've got for you today. Here at Radio Free we play music of course but in reality we're about something much bigger. What we're most interested in is heart change and we truly believe music can be a big factor in bringing heart change about but we also believe in the power of words. Hearts can just straight up be changed with raw words. So music and words both mighty tools and today we bring you an artist who is incredibly talented with both, Mr. Micah Borne. Yep. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, Micah. Well, I'm, we're so glad you're with us today, man. And we love your music here at Radio Free. We have a bunch of your stuff in regular rotation. Kane is able, no record of right, broken bones, and happy as can be is my jam. Like, if I'm having a bad day, uh, that, that song can just completely turn things around for me. But music is only part of what you do. You bring a lot to the table. But before we dig into what you're up to right now, let's start with a little bit of your backstory. Can you tell us where you were sure. born and raised, or maybe better yet, how you were raised? Yeah, I was uh, born and raised in Long Beach, California. Um, and I, I've been going to church since the womb. Uh, my parents uh, were, were very faithful Christian folk. Um, and also creative. My mother always would sing around the house. She'd just be singing old gospel songs, Negro spirituals. Um, and my dad uh, was was a poet and a, a storyteller. When we were real little kids, uh, he would read bedtime stories that he wrote. Uh, and so it was like from the beginning, even before I started engaging in creative writing and music and creativity, uh, I was just surrounded by it in my home. Wow. So it's just in your blood. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. So your parents are California born and raised? Uh, my dad was raised in California. He was born in Detroit. And my mom actually grew up in Youngstown, Ohio. Okay. How did What brought him out to, to California? Yeah, actually, um, so my dad's side of the family uh, is from Prentice, Mississippi, although he's born in Detroit. Um, and we're talking, uh, you know, years and years ago. My, my grandmother's in her 80s now, but she's one of 11 kids. And at the time, there was just a lot of prejudice happening in Prentice, Mississippi as a black family. So all of her brothers and sisters kind of at the same time decided we're, we're going to move out west. Um, and so um, wow. that's, that's what happened. She had first moved to Detroit, but then my grandma came out west with all her brothers and sisters from Prentice, Mississippi. Um, and then my mom was raised in Ohio until, um, until her early 20s, and she moved out to Long Beach because she had some family out here, and she just was trying to start over. And that's where she met my dad when she moved out here. Wow, what a great story, man. So so liter literally moving away from racism to another state. That's huge. Yeah. Your grandmother yeah, must have been a strong woman. Oh, yeah, she still is. She's still kicking too. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. All right. Yeah, you know, she's she's got a lot of a lot of wisdom in her. She's yeah, she's I think 85, 80 something. And um yeah, she she is just the type of wisdom you sit down and you know she don't have the huge vocabulary but i'll tell you she'll give you more wisdom than any doctor or philosopher with 12 degrees you know mm. so <laughs> and it's the yeah. deep stuff it's the real stuff life wisdom yeah absolutely well let's talk uh for a minute about spoken word um here's a quote from your website a group of strangers walked into a room in la one by one they stood up shared their most private thoughts struggles and desires to many this sounds terrifying but after seeing a spoken word open mic Micah was hooked. That day, he decided to give yeah. spoken word poetry a try, and it worked. So tell us about that, <laughs> yeah. man. So obviously, you, you had a lot of creativity in your home. Your dad was writing stories, writing bedtime stories. That's huge. So you got, you're surrounded by this, but something clicked when you walked into a, a spoken word situation? Yeah. So, well, a little more of the kind of the background is, so I, I grew up in love with hip hop at the time, um, in the you know '90s and early 2000s, especially coming out of Long Beach, there was a lot of MCs, a lot of rappers, Snoop Dogg, Nate Dogg, Warren G, um, and so just the area of the country I was in, 
I was so fascinated with the lyrics and the wordplay uh, within rap lyrics. But because there's a bunch of negative stereotypes about hip hop, um, it wasn't celebrated as an interest in creativity or creative writing or the poetry and the lyrics, even though it is. I didn't think about it as hey, when I, when I like their metaphors and their turn of phrase, I'm actually appreciating the poetic devices they're using. But those, those uh, connections, they didn't click in my head. I just thought, well, I like hip-hop, I like rap, and, and everybody's like, oh, rap is bad. So I kind of didn't really own it as an interest in, in something productive. I just was a listener. Uh, but when I got to college, uh, I met a friend who was really into hip-hop, and he had some recording equipment on his computer, and and he downloaded some free beats online. So my freshman year of school, he was like, hey, man, like, I got this recording equipment. Let's just mess around. And, you know, we love listening to hip hop. Let's try to write something. So I started rapping my freshman year. Um, but again, because I had all these um, stereotypes from other people in my head, even though I knew hip hop could be more than that, I didn't recognize it as creative writing. I was like, oh, I'm not writing. I'm, I'm rapping. Um, but then my, my junior year of college, um, I got invited, well, actually it was the summer before my junior year. I was home for the summer. I went to college in Chicago, but I was back in Long Beach and one of my homies invited me to a spoken word poetry open mic, which is actually the one I was describing in that um, story on my website. Um, it's this place called the poetry lounge. It happens every Tuesday night in LA. And so I went just cause my friend invited me and before that night, my idea of poetry, I had a very narrow idea of what poetry was, and that was, you know, Shakespearean, antiquated English, or really overly metaphorical imagery that just kind of confused me. That was the type of poetry I was exposed to. Um, but then I go to this spoken word open mic, and it was amazing, because you have people from all different backgrounds, all different philosophies and worldviews and cultures and religions and, and, and political views and everything. And yet person after person is getting up on stage and they're sharing their most private thoughts, things you wouldn't tell your best friend, things you, you know, you maybe write in your diary and hope nobody sees. They're saying it from the stage. And it was the most liberating feeling for me because I was like, whoa, like these things, even though Folks, the poets were from different cultures and different backgrounds. And on the on the superficial level, if I were to look at them, I would assume that I didn't have much in common with them or I couldn't relate to them. And yet they had the courage to be vulnerable about their story and their lives and the things they were wrestling with. And I'm sitting in the crowd like, man, I thought I was the only one. It, like mm -hmm. everything they're saying, I can relate to. I, I feel like like they just took off their mask and, and then everyone in the room took off their mask. Like, hey, we're all going through life, comparing ourselves to each other. But, but when we're just honest, we realize, hey, we're not the only ones in the world who, who thought this way or felt this way. And so that was like my first interest in spoken word poetry. I, did, I still hadn't really engaged much with kind of traditional page poetry, but I was like, after being at that open mic, I said, I have to be a part of it. Because if I feel so connected by folks sharing their stories, maybe if I shared my story, that could help somebody um, realize they're not the only ones in some of the things they're going through. I was so riding cold on my horse so high Fell down blind when I saw the light Walked by faith cause my sight was gone And I'm glad that it broke these bones So when you, when you brought that experience back to college, what happened? Mm -hmm. Well, the cool part was, so yeah, I started writing that summer. And then at the end of the summer, I, w I went back to Chicago. And I didn't know this at the time, but the city of Chicago has a very strong community of spoken word poetry. It's actually um, the birthplace of the Poetry Slam. Uh, that's this place called the Uptown Poetry Slam in uh, at the Green Mill in Chicago. That's, that's not where the art form got invented, but the competition of, of Poetry Slam. And then there's also this program called Louder Than a Bomb, which every year they go into public high schools and they do spoken word poetry workshops with students and then they have a tournament at the end of the year. So that, that's been going on for over 10 years. So it's just a very strong culture there. So I got introduced to it out here in California, but then I went back to Chicago and just started hitting up open mics left and right. And um, the, just the quality of poetry was so high, it kind of forced you to step your game up you know it was like yeah. uh, you gotta you gotta you gotta step your game up or get booed off stage so <laughs> um whereas uh la was a very welcoming environment for beginners but the the uptown poetry slam was like you gotta come with it so, so yeah i just fell in love with it um 
And so after two years of rapping my freshman and sophomore year, I started writing poetry as something that I just kind of did. Like in my mind, hip hop was still the, the main thing. And then every now and then I'd write a poem. But once I started going to so many open mics and seeing how people were responding to my poetry, suddenly it became like my focus and poetry and, and hip hop was something I kind of did on the side. Um, but at the, at the root of it all, at the core of it all, I just considered myself a creative writer. And so at different points in my life that manifests in different ways, because, you know, started off with hip hop, got into poetry, did that for about five, six years. And then I got an itch to write some blues music. And I just started listening to a lot of blues and being of African-American descent, when I heard the vocabulary, when I heard the stories being told, you know, it reminded me of my grandma from Prentice, Mississippi. I'm like, it reminded me of my uncles and aunties, even though I didn't grow up listening to a lot of blues. When I started listening to it as an adult, I was like, this resonates with me. Um, but it was a particular uh, different challenge as a writer, because both with hip hop and spoken word, both of those genres are, are very wordy. You do a whole lot of words in, in a three to five minute song, but with blues lyrics, I think one of the beauty uh, beauties of blues is that you have very few words, often very simple and repetitive vocabularies, but it just it just sinks into your soul. You know, so the amount of words per song in a blues song versus a spoken word poem or a rap song, it might be a third or a quarter of the <laughs> amount of words, but when it's done well, it hits you just as just as deeply. Um like I remember one of the first uh kind of blues acts I got into with these two older guys named Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee. And uh, they have this song called Burnt Child. And the chorus just goes, I'm a burnt child and I'm afraid of fire. And that just like <laughs> one sentence, but I was just like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, so that type of thing just, um, so yeah. And, and I will, I will write in any, any idea that comes to me. If I feel inspired, I'll give it a try. And so I'm, I'm glad I did because I've ended up producing things in, in multiple genres and, and I've had a good time. I've grown as an artist and, and created work that resonates with people because, you know, some folks might not be into spoken word poetry, but they'll check out my blues stuff or some folks might not like blues, but they'll check out my hip hop. So, you know, that's sort of what what got us in, you know, um, the first song I heard was Happy As Can Be. And honestly, when I heard it first, uh, you know, I knew nothing about you, and I heard it. I was, I was pictured this old African American man sitting on his porch with <laughs> with a dobro stomping, you know, singing yeah, the blues. And I was, totally. and then I looked you up. I was like, wait, what? You know, like what's going? On? And so, what do you think resonated so deeply with you about the blues? Now, I know that the origin of the blues is is deeply African American, solely, singularly African American, and so something feels like culturally, it's just in the DNA, but. Where'd you hear that record you just were talking about? Where'd you even hear that? Well, actually, you know, I, I've had a lot of random, <laughs> random experiences. Um, Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee, I got introduced to them when I was in Canada. I was touring for poetry in Calgary, and I met a, a, a homeless gentleman, an older white guy, who loved art and loved poetry. And and I told him this was in my very beginning stages. I was like, man, yeah, I really kind of, I'm really getting into blues lately. And his eyes just lit up. And he goes, you got to check out these guys named Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee. So yeah, an old <laughs> Canadian uh, homeless gentleman introduced me to them. Um, uh, but, you know, for, for, for me, um, it's just, like I said, I, I got into it because actually it was a blues rock band, the Black Keys. Is, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love their music. So I started listening to the Black Keys. Um, that, and they were introduced to me by a friend of mine. And so from there, I made a Pandora radio station where, you know, you put in one artist and then they'll just play artists who have similar yeah, related music to right. discover new things. So I, I made a Pandora station, made Black Keys the first input. And then from there, because they are so heavily influenced by the blues, all these old school blues songs start, start popping up. Mm. And, um, and I was like, oh, man, <laughs> I was like, uh, you know, some names I'd recognize, like the bigger act like B.B. King. But then there was a lot of a lot of artists that because I didn't grow up listening to blues, I never heard of. And I'm just listening. And there's just the simplicity and this beauty and all of these voices. Um, and the thing about it is I, I wasn't a singer in the traditional sense. I, I don't have a finesse voice like, you know, uh, an R&B singer or something like that or a pop artist. Um, but what I noticed about the blues was it wasn't about a polished voice. It was about a voice that could capture the right emotion. Mm. And, and that is something that I had 
gotten good at channeling emotion through spoken word poetry. It's very emotive. You know, it, it's a whole lot of channeling particular emotions. And then just the fact that it's blues as well, taking difficult experiences and yet creating something beautiful out of it. In, in a lot of ways, I was well versed in that. Um, first, just being African American and the story of the culture of my folk, you know, uh, but then also personally, um, I have a lot of uh, health problems. And uh, especially for someone my age, I have a condition called ulcerative colitis. I have issues with my joints. I've had multiple shoulder surgeries. And, I, and I, I'm hospitalized a few times a year for, for different reasons. And, uh, you know, the interesting part is that the song you mentioned, Happy As Can Be, it was actually, uh, uh, I was having a terrible day. I was anything besides happy. Mm. And, you know, I, I don't believe in the sense of like mind over matter, like just think things into being. But I do believe, you know, at, at, at any point in life, there are always things to celebrate and there are always things to mourn. That's, that's how life is. Mm. And you do have a choice to focus on one or the other. And it's not like you have to, I mean, but I just, I remember thinking I was laying in bed and my whole body hurt like Everything in me hurt. I was having a lot of issues with my, I had a flare of my colitis and um, financially things were tough. And, and I was just in a, in, a, in a really tough situation, but I had been feeling this way for weeks. And so I had found myself just complaining, 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 complaining. And I was like, you know what? Like, despite all of this, there at the same time is a lot of beautiful things in my life that I'm thankful for. And I'm still happy to be alive. And so I said, I don't feel like writing a song about being happy, but I'm going to do it anyway. And mm. I'm going to force myself creatively to kind of write something until I, I start believing it. And I'm reminded that, yes, there's pain, but there's also beauty. And, and as a person of faith, I actually believe that the beauty in the world is much stronger uh, than the pain. I believe often we'll talk about pain and beauty like, you know, um, uh, We'll talk about like light and dark, God and Satan, good and evil, and we'll put them side by side like they're equal but opposite. And and that's something that I strongly disagree with, because if, if those forces are just equal but opposite, then there's no guarantee that, that truth is going to defeat uh, lies, that, that good is going to defeat evil. But But the way I believe is that the power of good, no matter how it may seem, is, is overwhelmingly stronger than the things that come against it. The power of God is overwhelmingly stronger than the power of Satan. The power of love is overwhelmingly stronger than the power of hate. And so in that moment, as I was feeling tempted to just be a pessimist and complain about how bad my life was, I said, no, you know, I'm going to acknowledge this pain, but I'm going to remind myself of the beauty. And so that's exactly what the song says. It's, you know, as I lay here living, as opposed to dying, because I felt like I was dying, right? I said, as I lay here living, pain from head to feet. You know, death's going to get me good one day, but now my heart still beats. Long as my world's spinning, I refuse to be dead while I'm still living. I'm as happy as can be. And so that's where that song comes from. Happy as can be, happy as can be. So, all right, so well, while we're talking about that song, um, you got a little guest vocal from another Radio Free favorite, Liz oh. Vice. Tell me about that connection. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That is one of my favorite stories in the world because uh, it's so random. Um, I, I used to live in Oregon for two years. After I graduated college, I, I moved to Central Oregon, um, and Liz is from Portland. And so we had some overlapping friends in the creative community, but I had never met her. Um, but a friend of mine introduced me to her work a few years back, and I became a fan. I was just like, wow, <laughs> she's yeah. amazing. Um, but I didn't know her, and and uh, all of these things are coming full circle, especially since you're asking about this song. But what ended up happening was um, I decided to do a blues album, wrote several songs um, that <clears throat> that required a female vocalist. And I remember thinking to myself, man, I need a really strong bluesy vocal. Man, that, that Liz Vice lady, she would be excellent. Uh, but I don't know her. And her career, from my perspective, seemed to be taking off, and she seemed a little out of reach. Um, but what ended up happening was I, I got sick, and I was hospitalized. And so I am in the hospital for days, um, and my, my family brought me my computer, um, so I'm like online and I'm trying to think about about these songs and these features. And then I, I just, I don't know why. It was something about 
I felt so low. I was like, I got nothing to lose anyway. I might as well just give it a shot. So I went on her website and I was like, I'll just send her a message. But her website looked way too official. It seemed like there was a lot of layers. <laughs> so instead, um, I went on her Facebook, her artist Facebook, and, and I just sent a message there. And I wrote a constitution of an email of like, <laughs> hello, my name is Micah Bornet. This is what I do. I'm a spoken word poet, but I'm doing a blues album. I know you don't know me, but we have mutual friends. I'm a fan of your work. You know, I understand if you don't like to work with people you don't know personally, but I, I usually don't either, but I, I think we would jive. And so it was <laughs> ridiculously long. And she responded in two minutes. <laughs> And she goes, she goes, you're not going to believe this. Two years ago, my roommate went to this conference and she came home with this CD of spoken word poetry by this artist that I love. I just, I, I listened to it because she gave it to me and it's you. I've actually been listening to your poems for the last two years. Of course, I want to work with you. Wow. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Wow. And so I was up here, you know, I was just like fanboying out on her thinking like she was on another level. And then she actually was a huge fan of mine. So it was a, a, a very quick and easy friendship. Um, and so I just kind of told her about the blues album and what my vision was. And and she caught on real quick. She loved the lyrics. She loved the style. Um, and so, yeah, so we ended up working together. She's on she's featured on three different tracks um, on on No Ugly Babies, my blues album, but also on a lot of other tracks where she's not featured. She's doing background vocals as well so her her voice is a very important contribution to my project and, and i appreciate her friendship and, and we have continued to stay in touch and, and work together actually we're uh can't say too much but we are collaborating on on some stuff uh both for for me and her um in our projects coming out in the next few couple of years so oh man yeah. that's good news yeah. Well, cool, man. Well, let's talk. Uh, let's let's veer into um, the concept behind "No Ugly Babies" for a second. Um, I'd love yeah. to hear the story behind that title. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. You know, um, one thing I, that is important to me um, because it affects my life personally. Uh, I, I'm constantly uh, trying to help people understand uh, both within the black community and outside of the black community, um, just the, the struggle, the story. Um, a lot of people uh, who aren't black particularly have this, this concept that, um, you know, racism is, is a thing of the past. And it's not really, uh, you know, we're allowed to eat at the same restaurants and, and things like that now. Um, and and we, we've elected a black president, you know, in this nation. But really, what, what else is there? That, that you want, you know, what are you complaining about? But what I've found is um, the, the type of prejudice and racism that is, is not as overt as, you know, colored only, white only signs. Um, the, the more subtle, the more woven into culture it is, the, it, it, it's more stubborn, it's more deeply rooted. And, and what I try to help, help folks understand is there's a lot of things that on the surface level don't seem like a prejudice, but they're they are and and they're so subtle but they're they're still affecting our lives on a very regular basis so for example um the no ugly babies particularly um both the song and the concept it it comes from cultural standards of beauty um in in a lot of ways and there is both within and with outside of the black community because the black community as much as we hate prejudice we also were raised in in a culture that believes that. And so um, the, one of the main things is darker skinned black people um, are often seen as less attractive. If you're talking about, and, and again, this is within the black community as well, you have the, the fair skin, the light skinned girl or the mixed girl who's, you know, half Latino or half white or, you know, with the quote unquote good hair, you know, with the wavy hair instead of the, instead of the, you know, nappy hair or the oh you look like you straight from africa you know your nose and your your you black as night or you purple you blue black all this type of negative um language both within the black community and outside of the black community um uh, is something that that really burdens me um as i've seen it affect myself my family people i love and and so no ugly babies the title came from something my mother uh used to say and as much as i now, as an adult, I look and I see the cultural standards of beauty. Um, growing up, I was always comfortable in my own skin, largely because of the way that my parents and my mother affirmed me. And she affirmed all of us. I'm one of six kids. And she would always say, God ain't gave me no ugly baby. Hmm. All my daughters is pretty and all my sons is handsome. And so I was raised 
with that as the idea. And, and so I've always felt comfortable in my own skin. But as soon as I got older, I started to observe. And, and that song, it's, it's kind of exposing subtly in one example of culture. So you have a, a fairy tale, uh, Snow White, which is a story that we all grew up with watching. And in this story tale, you have a worldwide beauty pageant kind of a hunt for mirror, mirror on the wall, the, the wicked witch says, who's the fairest of them all? And so she's associating the most beautiful with the most fair. And who is the winner of this worldwide beauty pageant? Literally Snow White, whose skin is white as snow. <laughs> and so the second verse of No Ugly Babies, it says, you know, mirror, mirror on the wall, this skin here ain't fair. Life ain't been no fairy tale, and ain't nothing been fair. Ain't no shame in losing in a race for vanity. Hammer to your looking glass. My mama said to me, God ain't gave me no ugly baby. Mm -hmm. And so it's again, it's like here we have something in culture that's subtle that people don't even realize. Hey, actually, yeah, the most beautiful person that they could find is Snow White. Now, this is not to say that fair skin is not beautiful, but it is to say it's not the standard of beauty that we, we've been taught it is. When your enemies are hungry, feed them. When they thirsty for blood, pour them up a cup of blood. Even wicked. Well, let's bring this full circle, Micah. Like you, you've posed a lot of questions. You've you've presented a lot of struggles and disparity. What's the answer to that? I I I feel like it's a I'm setting you up here, but the. The reality is, you know, why, why, you, why we were attracted to you to begin with, there's a lot of truth in what you say. And I know in culture today, everything's relative, right? Everybody's got a truth, whatever. But we believe that there is one truth. We believe there is one Savior. How does that tie into what you're talking about? Where does that, where does that fit in your life, in your, in your journey? You know, that was the second reason why I was very motivated to uh, write spoken word poetry because I, I went to that open mic and I was so appreciative and inspired by the vulnerability. However, um, at the end of that night, and as I started going to more events like that, um, there's this idea that, um, the confession is the healing and people were just getting a lot of things out. They were getting it off their chest, but then they weren't going anywhere after that. It was like, oh, wow, we're all broken, and we're, we've all been, uh, you know, abused or molested or brokenhearted or betrayed, and, oh, man, you're not alone in that. And it's like, yeah, it's good to realize you're not alone in that. However, what do we do after that? And, and I, I think there is something to do after that. I do believe in healing. I do believe in resurrection and new life. And so uh, as a person of Christian faith, I was motivated because I, I found um, open mics to be a space where people were already being so vulnerable with their pain, but there wasn't a lot of hope or or answer being presented, and a lot of a lot of truth besides the pain aspect of the truth. Uh, and so, I but I wanted to make sure that I I approached it in a way that wasn't just you know, a really kind of a basic Jesus Band-Aid on top of everything. Like, everything sucks, oh, but Jesus makes everything better, and when you die, you go to heaven. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, and so, which is why there is constantly that, that back-and-forth tension in a lot of my work, but um, my desire is that the way I understand the gospel and truth and resurrection and, and healing of both of the heart and the physical body um, being a real thing, um, I hope that by the time people get to the end of maybe not every single song or poem, but when you really engage with my work, when you listen to the whole album, when you listen to several poems, that you would hear the pain, but you would also hear the, the overcoming, uh, you know, the, the hope to, to not grow weary of doing good, um, the belief that, yes, pain exists, but, but God and light and truth and, you know, and love is stronger than Satan and darkness and lies and hate. Um, and just like I was saying before. So, so that's my, my hope is to, to present the truth in a way that acknowledges the reality and the pain. Um, but, but yeah, life is, to me, life is just, is constant tension. And, and uh, I, I want to present that, but I do want to present hope. I, I wanted my, my uh, spoken word album, my second spoken word album was called Alive and Ill. 
And it was just kind of a continuation of, of this theme. Um, and the way I kind of cap that album, the beginning and, and the end of it, I start with this story of a time when my older sister, um, she's the only one of us, there's six of us, she, she's married, and um, she she got pregnant with my nephew. And at the same time, I had an aunt who was really sick. She had sickle cell. She went to the hospital and fell into a coma. And the doctors were monitoring her, and they, they told our family, hey, um, it doesn't look like she's going to last too long. Uh, we expect her to, to pass away uh, within the next week or so. Um, but at the same time, my, my sister was due in the next week or so. And so I go to bed one night, and my phone rings at 4 in the morning. And I'm like, who the heck is calling me at four in the morning? And then I look and it's my mom. And I just, I freeze. I freeze because I know that there's only two reasons my mother would be calling me at four in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure which one it was. A part of me, I was so excited that my nephew was going to be in the world. But then the other part of me was like, but maybe my auntie just left. Maybe she just passed away. And I didn't know how to feel. And I, it, it, I was just frozen. And I think like that, the way I felt in that moment, um, that often is the human experience, right? It's mm-hmm. like at every second there is beauty and, and, and falling in love and new life and creativity and, and, and the stars and the sun and the moon, right? And then at the same time, there is pain and rape and war and disappointment and death. And it's like, what do you do with that tension? Um, and so that's how that album starts. I tell that story. And a lot of the, the poems are about the tension, whether it be racism or me dealing with my personal sickness in uh, this poem called What a Fool. But then it ends um, towards the end of the album. There's a, a poem called Dry Bones. And, and that, that is about resurrection. That is about the fact that the, the power of Jesus um, overcomes all the evil and all the darkness in the world, and not just in eternity, but also on, on this side of, of death, um, that we can live and hope and know that the truth is, is stronger and is victorious. Um, and, you know, uh, Paul really, he centers it on the resurrection of life, both literally and metaphorically, the literal resurrection um, of, of Jesus from the dead, but the metaphorical resurrection of our hearts and our souls and our spirits and our hope. Um, and he says, look, you know, with, without, without belief in resurrection, uh, then our faith is futile. You know, if, if, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, he says, then, then eat and drink for tomorrow we will die. If, if all we can do is confess our pain and write poems about the sadness, um, then it's really meaningless, you know. It, but he goes, but that Christ did resurrect. And so we don't have to be hopeless. We don't have to just despair. We can celebrate and we can look at death in the face and say, oh, death, where is your sting? You know, like, yeah, you got us, but you didn't keep us. Uh, we defeated you. And, and I, I strongly believe that. I've seen, I've seen it in my life. I've seen myself be able to create beauty even in my darkest hour. I've seen the power of love and truth and creativity and God um, overcome so many of the other things that have tempted me to, to lose faith, to feel hopeless. And, and, um, and then the sharing of that too, both in my work and in my life, it just gives me even more hope, you know, to know that these things like, no offense, but you know, I wasn't necessarily writing them for other people at first. I was just processing my life. I was processing my pain. Um, but I was honest in that. And then to see how God can use that uh, to encourage other people, you know, and, and I think about that often when I read scripture as well, you know, you read the writings of David and the Psalms and things like that. Um, I really don't think uh, a lot of the times he was thinking about people living thousands of years later. I think he was just processing his own pain, you know, and processing his own relationship with God and the beauty, you know, when, when he's talking about all the ways that, that he messed up and he's like, you know, when I remain silent, my bones wasted away within me. But, you know, when I confessed my sin to the Lord, he felt new life again. And he said, blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. You know, that wasn't just a theological statement for other people. That was a personal statement of, man, I know what it's like to feel dead inside because I had this secret, hidden sins, these awful things that I had done. 
But then when it came to light and when I had the courage to confess and own up to it, God resurrected me. Blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. Um, and so, yeah, I, I want to write about the pain. I want to write about the secret dark place, but I also want to write about the blessing of, of resurrection. Well, I said, rip me open, watch me bleed. Raise your head, look at me. Say hello, watch me smile. Well, Micah Borne, we are glad you do, man. And we hope that you will continue to do that. Can you tell us a little bit about plans for the future? I mean, you, you hinted, we won't go into the details, but you hinted about <laughs> something that you and Liz working on, Liz Vice. But what else you got going on? I, I was looking on your website for some tour dates. I want, I, wanna, I want you to be coming near us somewhere so we can come check you out. What's, uh, what's in the future? Oh, yeah. I need to get better with keeping my tour dates updated. But, uh, you know, uh, most of the time I just am kind of uh, just going all over the map, pinballing, um, both domestically and internationally. Um, so I'll try to get the, the dates up, updated. But as far as projects for the future, um, so I have two EPs of hip-hop that I put out, but I've never done a full-length album of, of rap. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I think because it was my first love that I put a lot of pressure on myself to make it really, really good. You know, mm-hmm. so I've, I've been hesitant to put out the full length album, um, but somehow found the courage to sing when I never sang before. But um, <laughs> at the moment, though, um, as kind of the ebbs and flows of my creativity, I've been writing a lot more hip hop. So uh, within the next two years, I would say for sure, maybe sooner, I'm going to try to put out a full length hip hop album. Um, but then on a more shorter term goal, there is... Um, uh, actually, on on one of the songs on No Ugly Babies, it's a song called um, Po Boy Clean. Um, at the end of the song, there is a ridiculous solo um, mm-hmm. by an incredible keyboardist, um, and her name is Jackie McLeod. And she actually, I met her through Liz. She she plays keys for Liz's band when oh, Liz tours. I met her um, too. She came she, through town with Liz, and she, dude, she's next level, yeah, man. Oh my gosh. She is yeah, she is a beast. Um, so she is a classically trained pianist, but plays in all kinds of genres, blues and whatever. Um, but anyway, we, we became friends through Liz. And it was interesting because she was talking about a lot of her personal uh, music. She composes beautiful music, but um, often younger folks uh, don't engage with classical music as often or go to classical concerts. And so I was just talking to her about uh, her desire to have her music hit kind of folks who do listen to pop and hip hop and, and folks in their, you know, teenagers, twenties and thirties. And so, uh, an idea we came up with was kind of marrying what she does with, with, uh, what I do. And so we are working on an, an EP, uh, five to seven songs where it's going to be, uh, me doing some spoken word poetry over some of her original compositions kind of mixed with pop and hip hop percussions and influences as well. So we don't exactly know exactly what it is yet or what we're going to call it, but it's going to be a blend of some of her incredible uh, skills on the keys and piano, uh, classically influenced, but also spoken word and hip hop influenced as well. And we hope to release that this later this year. Awesome, so, man. Yeah, those are the big two. Oh, and the last thing is I am working on a book of poetry. I've never put out my, my poems in print, only on um, recording CDs. Um, but yeah, I am working on a book as well. Awesome, man. Well, what if someone is listening who is, is curiosity is thoroughly piqued by this point, where can they go to find more information about Micah Bornet? So uh, first of all, my website is just micahbornet.com, M-I-C-A-H-B-O-U-R-N-E-S.com. And there's a lot of videos you can watch of me performing. Um, But if you actually want to uh, uh, engage with my recordings, um, they are available, first of all, for free. Uh, Everything I've ever put out is available for free download through my Bandcamp, and that's just micahbornet.bandcamp.com. Right now, there is an EP of hip-hop called 820 North LaSalle, there is two full-length albums of spoken word poetry, The Man Without a Name and Alive and Ill. And then there is an album of blues, No Ugly Babies, the one we were talking about. Um, and then, so you can download them for free or you could leave a tip. It gives you the option. Um, and then they're also available on iTunes. Um, and so, yeah, if you are interested in any of my stuff um, or even engaging or asking any questions about it or having me come out to your community, I'm super easily accessible through uh, Instagram, through Facebook, through my website. All of those channels go directly to me. 
Well, great, Micah. I will put all that info in the show notes, all the links. So once again, thank you so much, Micah Bornet, for calling in today. We wish you the best, my friend, and we want to thank you for being a part of Radio Free. If you have any questions or comments about the guests we feature here on Radio Free, please send an email to info at radiofree.cc. And thanks again for listening to the Radio Free Podcast. Cause you now I know it was cheap. Yeah. So I don't